Hello, it's the ghost. Welcome to A Stranger World Than Fiction, where we are taking a look at what's all going on out there in our world. And this has to do with a haunting. This account that started off as a bit of a love story, the too good to be true type that we all somehow think we'd like to have, turned out to be a sad and strange experience. And we're talking about the strange and unusual here on Stranger World. Take a listen to this account of Ellie and Jeff and all that was affected. Let's see what they've got, and then I'll give you my opinion after. Hello, Reddit. My name is Amy, and I need to put my story out into the world. I know most of you will probably just think this is made up and intended to scare you, but it is the whole truth and I just, I just need to get it off my chest. And even if there is just one person out there who believes me, perhaps even someone who has gone through something similar, then that will leave me at peace. Although I'll be at peace soon anyway. But um, let's not jump ahead. Where else to start but at the beginning, right? This is my story, but... It's also the story of me and Jeff, and Jeff's story is my story because I honestly can't remember life without him in it. So to make it simple and short, we went to elementary school together, and after being friends for a few years, we finally became boyfriend and girlfriend. Of course, when you become an item in elementary school, it isn't really an item, it's just friendship. I think it started in the usual sort of silly way. Jeff told people he liked me, got someone else to tell me, and asked if I liked him back. At first I gave the standard, ew, boy, is disgusting, sort of response, but after the incessant teasing and the same back and forth with the do you like him back questioning, I finally gave in and I asked him to be my boyfriend. It's practically just a close friendship when you're that age, isn't it? You hold hands, okay, and you kiss, mostly on the cheek or perhaps a quick peck on the lips, but that's the extent of it. Oh, and we went on dates with our parents present to the cinema and things like that childish romance if you can even call it that that usually never lasts beyond a few weeks months at the most except except me and jeff did the years kept flying by and before we knew it we were getting ready to go to high school i know what you're thinking any relationship that by some miracle survived the whole way through elementary school can never make it through even the first few weeks of high school and I'd agree with you. If me and Jeff had ever had any kids and my son or daughter got themselves a little partner, you certainly wouldn't expect it to last very long. And then they start high school and of course their hormones run wild. So even if they do go to the same high school, they're bound to want to explore what else is out there. Your eyes are all over the place at that age, as soon as you're able to develop a sexual attraction to the opposite sex. so. Why would you want to stay in what is essentially a glorified friendship as a relationship? That I'm even having to convince you of this minuscule point doesn't bode well for the rest of the story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The point is, this was all a lot of rambling just to say, me and Jeff made it through high school. We did have the luxury of going to the same school, but I think we'd have even made it through that. We were the exception to the rule. High school was awesome. People were jealous, just as lustful teens are bound to be, but we didn't realize. We were in our own little world. That was when we started kissing, and I mean real kissing. It was cool to learn together, because obviously we were already comfortable with one another by that point. There was no awkwardness or weirdness. It was wonderful. And obviously, as the years went by, we <laughs> discovered sex, and that went pretty much the same way as the kissing. I'm not here to tell you a romance story or some erotica, so I'll leave it there. I just wanted you to have some sort of idea about how we grew together during our formative years. Well, throughout our entire lives, really. So there we have it. Elementary school, check. High school, check. Next stop, college. I'm sorry to keep going on. This isn't just a life drama or a, a, a romance. I've told you that. I just really need you to understand everything. Besides, I am summing up most of my life in only a few paragraphs. Keep with me and you'll start to understand why I brought you here. Why I needed to share this thing with you. So, college. 
You get the picture by now. We survived it together. Me and Jeff. Even with all the partying and the hunky men and the pretty ladies, we, we never strayed from one another's side. I mean, looking is okay, isn't it? We both established that early on. It's only natural and human to be attracted to other people. Look at it this way. Over 7 billion people in the world, are you only ever going to have eyes for just one? Are you only ever going to have feelings for just one? Are you only ever going to love just one? The answer is no. It would be ridiculous to think such a way. The point is that you show love and respect to whatever partner you choose and remain dedicated to them. And me and Jeff did. The best part of it? We didn't even go to the same college. We didn't live together, none of that. It wasn't long distance. That would have been difficult, even for us. But we got through it again and came out together on the other side. No breakups, no cheating, barely any fighting. In fact, the worst it ever got was both of us getting frustrated and not seeing enough of one another. And that's not even a fight really, is it? On that point though, we did start looking for places as soon as we finished college, and the search didn't last very long. Places are so easy to come by these days, and people want to rent or sell fast. Naturally, having just come out of college, we were only in a position to rent. That was okay though. We just wanted to be together, and if it took a while to save up, then so be it. We'd go from being together in a rented house to being together in a bought one. What was the difference? Material possessions don't define a relationship. On moving in day, it was just the two of us sorting everything out. We didn't really have much, and besides, we wanted to sort everything out ourselves. It felt right. And it was on that day, outside our new home, before we opened the door with our keys, that Jeff proposed to me. There wasn't anyone around to see and awkwardly walk past or offer an applause, but I preferred it that way. We'd always been trapped in our own little world, so it only made sense that all of the best and most significant moments we shared with one another should have been in private. A part of me, and a part of Jeff, I'm sure, considered just getting married with two witnesses, probably one from each side, and just do it that way. It would have been wonderful, but doing that would have also made a lot of people angry, hurt, and confused, namely our families. So that wasn't a real option, but it was nice to dream of. Of course, having just moved in together and with all the expenses involved in that, this wasn't like a, we're gonna get married right away thing. It was more like a, we'll get married in a year or two when we're a bit more settled and have a bit more money saved sort of thing. Boring, I know, but sensible. So anyway, we moved in and got settled and it was the most amazing feeling in the world to finally have our own space together away from friends, away from family, away from the whole world it felt like. And that was always our thing, being in our own bubble. And of course, just as we as people evolve with age, so does a relationship. In school, we were in our own social bubble. In college, we were faithful and only had one another. Believe me, in college, that's as good as it gets. And now we had our own house, our own space. God, I'm rambling. I'm sure I don't have to explain all of this to you, do I? You've probably been through similar experiences and felt similar things. I'm, I'm sorry. I know you're not stupid. I just need you to understand. I could have started the story right in the middle, right where the action kicked in. But if I had done that, you wouldn't have had the full picture. I need you to understand that me and Jeff loved each other. He loved me and I loved him. Whatever happens next is, is a mistake and I wish every single day that I could take it back. Got it? So, something to explain. Like I said earlier on in this post, me and Jeff had another standing about being attracted to other people, even about liking other people. It was just about being respectful enough to each other to never act on those feelings. Anyway, there was this place I went to with my lady friends every Friday night, just this bar in the city center. A small place, never very busy, and that's why we liked it. We could sit around, have a couple drinks, and catch each other up on whatever drama had been happening during the week. Well, behind the bar there was this... This guy. How do I describe him? God, he was... He just belonged in a modeling career, rather than serving people drinks from behind a bar. I'll put it that way. 
tan skin, black hair, and piercing blue eyes just to top it all off. He was always wearing tight black jeans and a t-shirt that always, always accentuated his features. Toned features, that is. <laughs> um, now, I know what you're thinking, and no, this isn't where the story is going. Well, maybe it is where it's going, but not in the way that you think. I even told Jeff about this guy and how in love with him me and all the girls were. That's just the kind of relationship me and Jeff had. And he would always tell me if there was a woman him and his friends had seen who was beautiful. And as was the case with my friendship group, many of Jeff's guy friends were single, so would always end up hooking up with these women. Naturally, a couple of my lady friends were single too and always tried to flirt with this barman. And he was always polite and friendly, but never let it go beyond that. A lot of them wanted me to flirt with him just to see if I could be the one to break him down. Now, another thing. Me and Jeff understood that flirting was fine as long as it never went beyond that. Never put yourself in a position where something can happen. That was our rule. And if I was to flirt with this barman, who I saw every single week and he responded in the same way, then I feared I would be putting myself in a situation that I did not want to be in. You see what I'm saying, right? Jesus, I'm rambling again. I'm sorry. This isn't just some lady drama or some Fifty Shades rubbish, I promise you. If anything, this is a horror story, plain and simple. Horror. I should mention that mine and Jeff's plans for the wedding picked up pretty quickly. Much quicker than we expected, because we were both in employment and had overestimated the impact of the house bills. We've been saving a lot, and so only six months into living in our new place, we were finally able to get plans for a wedding in place. We booked a venue, and a date most importantly, and got invites sent out for the following summer, and then got to work on other little things such as getting a caterer sorted out and a DJ, or perhaps a band if we found one we both liked. We didn't want a massive wedding anyway, just family and very close friends, so this wasn't going to cost us a fortune. So one night, me and my lady friends were at the bar, and they were ogling this barman as usual. I was pretty sure he'd become aware of when we were talking about him at this point, but the other ladies didn't seem to care. When they did their usual thing of getting on at me to go over and flirt with him. By this stage, literally every other woman in the group had tried and failed to break him down. I refused, as usual. Like I said, I didn't want to put myself in any sort of situation where I could be perceived or was actually being unfaithful to Jeff. That, and it was hilarious watching the desperation with which my friends really wanted me to try and be the one to break through to this handsome man. Look, one of them said, you're going to be married pretty soon. It's only a few weeks away. In the old times, you were never, you know, official until you were married. Only when you were married were you supposed to remain faithful to each other. I thought this was the whole point of bachelor and bachelorette parties. She asked, and everyone else laughed, but was also nodding along, apparently believing that this crazy pitch might actually work on me. Bit archaic, don't you think? I said. Me and Jeff have been together since we were pretty much toddlers, and that's not even much of an exaggeration. I'm not going to throw everything away now just because- Okay, think of it this way, another friend interrupted. One man for your whole life. For the rest of your life. Don't you want to try something different? Just to make sure that Jeff is the one? Jeff is the one, I said simply. This back and forth went on for a while, until one of my friends delivered the killer pitch. The pitch that actually worked. The pitch that made me go over there to that barman and flirt away without so much as another protestation. What do you think they do on these men's drinking nights? One of my friends said. We're women. We sit around and talk about feelings and gossip and whatever else. Sure, we lost over one barman, dude, but that's the extent of it. Men act on those urges, believe me. I bet Jeff's had a similar conversation to this one with his friends, and being a man, he did it. I would have been offended, but pretty much every woman in attendance had been cheated on by a partner. N no, he... No, I'd know. Men are better at lying than us, another friend said. Every other head of the table was nodding in agreement. That was it. Almost 20 years of building a bond, establishing trust, shattered by one argument from a group of friends. 
All those years at uni when we weren't together for extended periods of time, all these Friday nights with his male friends. I mean, I'd never done anything, but they were all right. Men were different, and their minds, their bodies, all of it worked differently in a way that we couldn't understand. So I went up to the bar and sat there while I ordered a drink. The barman was as smiley as ever, warm and welcoming, friendly. God, his eyes, so blue, so light, and in such contrast to the dark shade of his skin. They really stood out. They were all-consuming, intense, and and made me feel vulnerable. Somehow we got to talking, probably just the usual small talk to start with. Me asking him how he came to work here, does he live locally, and him returning the same question to me. It turned out he did live locally, and, well, he was younger than I thought. He just worked the bar at weekends while he was at college. He was in his final year, thank God, so that put him at 20 or 21. And would you believe it, it turned out he was doing the same degree that I'd done. That's when we really hit it off, and before I knew it, I'd lost track of time, and my friends actually upped and left. I'd been at the bar for hours without even realizing it. Anyway, coming to my senses and not wanting to be left alone in what could quickly descend into a compromising situation, I left with my friends, but not before the barman gave me his number. A few days later, in the middle of the week, I text him. And we hit it off in text, too. As you can imagine, I, I didn't tell Jeff. It was probably the first thing I'd never told him. I didn't want to lie to him, and I didn't exactly know where this thing with the barman was going, but I couldn't get the thought out of my head that Jeff had done something behind my back. About two weeks later, a week before mine and Jeff's wedding, the barman told me he was free on the upcoming Friday. He'd got the day off work, and so I canceled the girls and just told them I wasn't feeling too well. Pre-wedding nerves, that sort of thing. Jeff always went straight to the pub from work on a Friday, so I didn't have to make any excuses to him. And when it came to the barman, well, I just invited him over. I told you this wasn't any sort of erotic nonsense, and it isn't, so I'll cut to the chase. He'd barely walked in the door when he gave me the look. And so we did it. It was fine, except it's true what they say. It's better with someone who knows you and who you have a deep bond and connection with rather than just some rando. And because of that, I felt myself thinking about Jeff the whole time. The whole time. We'd only just finished when the bedroom door opened and Jeff walked in. In the climax, we obviously hadn't heard him come into the house, but what exactly had Jeff heard? I, I can't explain the emotions of that moment. Time just froze, stood still, as did all of us. I wasn't expecting Jeff home so early. Jeff wouldn't have even been expecting me to be here, let alone in our bed with another man. And that other man himself had no idea that I was taken. An absolute catastrophe all around. And I thought it was about to get even worse when Jeff came toward us. We were both naked, so it was not like we were in a rush to get out of bed and defend ourselves or even run off. We both just pulled the covers tighter around us and babbled incoherently at Jeff. But as it turns out, he wasn't coming for us. He reached into the top drawer of his bedside table, pulled out a small revolver, and shot himself in the head. Just like that blood everywhere, brains everywhere. It felt like an eternity before me or the barman moved and finally called the police. They came and, of course, I had to tell them the whole story. There were suspicious looks, wife-to-be found in bed with her new lover, and her husband just happens to shoot himself after having found them. You see it in the movies all the time, don't you? When the woman kills the meant-to-be husband so she can run off with the other man? That's, that's not what happened here. And thankfully, that quickly became clear to the police upon a more thorough inspection of the scene. The blood splatter patterns, fingerprints on the gun, all that stuff. Me and the barman had to give statements, and of course, the story was in the paper a few days later. The whole story. All of it. I can't... I don't know how to... I'm sorry. I can't find the words. I I can't go into it too much because I find it so 
difficult to talk about. But I wasn't even allowed to Jeff's funeral. His family wouldn't allow me. <laughs> Can I really blame them? N no, no, I can't. I deserved it. They never spoke to me again, and even my own family were cold with me. It felt like they were only supporting me out of duty. Even my own friends, yup, the very same group who had pushed me to do what I'd done, stopped talking to me. I didn't even make any effort with these people, and not because I didn't care about them. I did. Of course I did. But because I knew I deserved this. Well, in the case of my friends, what they did was pretty awful. They played their hand in this whole bloody mess, too. I tried to reach out to the barman, I guess just to apologize, but he didn't want to talk to me either. So I just isolated myself and confined myself to the house me and Jeff had lived in, which was a torturous experience all by itself. And that's it. That was my life. For four weeks, anyway. That was when the barman's face showed up in the newspaper. Suicide. The article talked about how he was clearly very deeply disturbed, but I'd never seen anything of the sort from what I knew of him. And even in the short time that we had known each other and talked to each other, he'd seemed perfectly sane to me. More than that, he was a charming young man who'd I'd risked and thrown everything away for. What could have possibly happened in the four weeks between our affair and him killing himself? Was it the guilt over Jeff? I read on. It talks about a suicide note, and obviously it can't reprint it, but the article describes how the barman had referenced the voice. Singular. Don't crazy people normally hear multiple voices? And yet here's the barman claiming that a voice drove him to kill himself. I called the police and asked to talk about it to see if they could tell me anything about how he had killed himself. Obviously they said they couldn't and I was seconds away from telling them that I thought it might help them but didn't. Who would believe me? It was suicide to them, plain and simple, and they wouldn't want it complicated. I even called the newspaper thinking I might have more luck there. They'd clearly seen the suicide note and details on the case given what they'd written, but even they wouldn't tell me anything. Well, the person I spoke to said they wouldn't tell me anything unless I thought I could provide them with more information, and I considered telling them who I was, but I'd already suffered enough embarrassment over the whole thing. You might think me crazy, but it all made sense in my mind. You know how something just comes together like a light bulb moment? And deep down, even without the police or the newspaper telling me, I just knew that the barman had shot himself. So I couldn't say I was altogether too surprised when Jeff started paying me visits. Don't leave me now. We're nearly at the end. You've come this far, so you must be invested in the story, and every single word of what I've written is the truth, as hard as it has been at times. So please, please, keep reading. You may be tempted to close the tab and go back to whatever you were doing before you came across this, but I guarantee you this is 100% real. Google my name, search my local paper online, because I'll be in it before long. So here we go. Jeff's visits. Lipstick on the bathroom mirror at first. A drawing of a heart broken in two. The radio bursts into life at random moments, usually during the night, playing the song that me and Jeff had intended to be our first dance song. The sound of a man crying, echoing around the house, coming from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. I just felt a presence around the house, like eyes watching me. You know the feeling when you can feel someone's gaze burning into you? And there was just a coldness. I decided enough was enough. I had to settle this, and there was only one person to settle it with. That was Jeff. I went to the cemetery, straight to his grave, intending to talk to him. There were a lot of flowers there. Obviously, a lot of his friends and family were still paying him frequent visits. There were so many flowers that they covered the bottom half of his gravestone. I bent down and cleared the flowers out of the way to read it in its entirety. And there, underneath Jeff's name and date of birth and death, was my name. Including my date of birth and... And an end date. Today's date. 
as in the day I published this post on Reddit. Google me, you'll see it's the truth. Jeff wants me to be with him, I can feel it. He's punished me enough, and now we can be together in the afterlife, and I can try to explain everything to him. Unless... Unless I don't end up where he is. Unless I end up in the bad place. But the truth is, I just can't go on anymore. I built up this life, and then I tore it down with one stupid mistake. With one stupid action, being influenced by other people for perhaps the first time in my life. What's the point of going on? Why start all over again? Jeff has always been faithful to me. I know that now and shouldn't have had to put him through what I did in order to find that out. So I'll give him what he wants. Just like the barman gave him what he wanted. There's just one thing I haven't figured out. The barman said he'd heard the voice. I haven't yet. Nor do I think I will. Weird, isn't it? You know you've messed up when even the dead don't want to talk to you. All right, so no need to really beat around the bush on this one. This shared experience, to me, gets a thumbs down. Great storyteller. However, I'd say this definitely sounds like it should be in the creepypasta category, maybe. I will give the author credit, though. She did a good job. This person took what would already be a very devastating situation all around, and I mean all around, and made it even worse. She pulls you in with the personal stuff, and she strategically fits in little comments and things to keep you listening but I really see this more as being one of those B-cheese horror movies. You know what I mean? That in the end, and after she's haunted and completely taken over and run down as ragged as someone could be, she pulls it out and kicks some ass and wins in the end. I could see her stepping out of, you know, that old creepy house that in these movies young couples always seem to buy. And then she walks out into the sunshine ready to start her new life again. Oh, and somewhere she will find out that Jeff really did cheat on her. And so, as the film winds down, she ends up feeling satisfied and goes about her life with a new perspective. I also think that this account, Ellie's account, was pretty short. I think it's fiction, and I just think it could have been told in a better way in the end. But make no mistake, I give this a thumbs down. Storytelling, okay. Is this a real account? I don't think so. And those are my thoughts. What do you guys think? Do you believe Ellie? Share your thoughts. And thank you for listening today. Another crazy and claimed experience in our crazy world. Share what you think of this fight for love after death account. And until next time, I will talk to you all soon.